event or situation do you remember best in your life? Is it what you have done exactly one year ago, or is it your 18th birthday, for example, or is it perhaps the birth of your child, or is it unfortunately a kind of traumatic situation you experienced? I guess um, this is a situation in which you have been emotionally very much involved. So this is what the psychiatrist is very much into. We have a lot of uh, situations of our patients uh, and they have to deal with difficult emotional events uh, very often. I want to give a brief introduction into this topic of the, uh, of the uh, interactions between cognitive and emotional processes. And um, as a psychiatrist, I dealt with depressive disorders and bipolar disorders, is a manic depressive disorder um, in many cases. And for these disorders, this emotion cognition coupling is not only relevant for the symptoms, but also for therapeutical advances. Uh, but I, first of all, I have um, another example regarding dementia, not regarding de depression. And um, emotional arousal, for example, um, can be used to enhance memory performance. Katsuhi et al. performed a very nice study um, and he, the patients, as well as normal control probands, um, had to hear and to see a picture story. So, besides the pictures, the first phase here, and the second phase and the third phase, a narrative was given. But the story went in different, uh, different ways. The first phase was in a neutral condition, the middle one in the neutral and an emotional relevant condition and the third phase in a neutral again. So for example a mother is leaving home with a son to visit the, uh, the father who is working in a hospital. The middle phase was narrated like this, so they went to the hospital, they saw an emergency drill and then the final story again they went, uh, went home. And in the middle part the emotionally narrative was the boy was involved in an accident. But finally, they could. So they had to sort of try to uh, to um, to help him to stay alive. And the third part was a neutral one again. And you see that the normal control group, uh, they had to finally they had to remember as many um, uh, details of the pictures, yeah, or, and to remember them freely. So what you can see here is that in the first phase they they remembered about 90 percent, in the second phase about 70 percent, in the last phase about 90 percent. This is what happened, this was the, the blue line was the neutral emotional part in the middle or the, neut uh, the emotionally arousal, the story where the boy was involved in an accident, they remembered much more pictures. The demented patients had a, had a, not, had a lesser uh, amount of remembered picture details in the pictures, but showed a very much improvement due to the emotionally told story besides the pictures. They remembered nearly as many uh, details of the pictures as uh, the younger control patients. This is what we use uh, also in, for example, dance therapy or um, other kinds of emotionally relevant therapies. But there's another uh, aspect of emotion cognition coupling. For example, it's a mood congruence effect. That means if something has to be remembered, for example, positive stimuli, it's better remembered if, uh, if you're in a positive mood and the other and vice versa. And other examples which are relevant for this talk as well is if you are in a positive mood you're faster and more effective regarding decision making. And also you are more creative in problem solving. In contrast, if you're in a, in a negative or sad mood, the person's tend to be more analytical and systematic and problem solving, which is sometimes a good aspect, but, uh, but they tendence, have a, also a tendency to focus on details, which can be good as well. But normally, the positive mood uh, gives you more creativity. So what's the anatomical background of, about this? You have this limbic system, the colored, the colored structures shown here, and they are very much connected with the cortical, that means um, with the uh, brain of the higher brain functions. They interact each other, interact very much. The amygdala, for example, are very, uh, is a group of neurons which are very active, for example, in anxiety. Or if you see a dangerous situation, then these amygdala, the neurons fire and, 
and induce that you move forward very fast. Yeah? You can get away from the dangerous situation. The, the hippocampus, for example, is very relevant in memory processes and encoding processes. And altogether, it's a very much connected and interacting, interacting uh, system. So how can you measure these interactions? You can use functional magnetic resonance imaging, for example, but you can also use electrical currents, which you can measure from the skull. The EEG, it's electroencephalography, you can use, and well, this is what we did. And uh, I show you data on these three electrode positions, it's the midline electrode positions here. And, but we did not, did not only use the EEG, but we also used the so-called event-related brain potentials. And these are, due to a mathematical uh, procedure, signals which are time-locked to a certain stimulus you are presenting. So, while measuring the EEG, you can present, for example, words on a video monitor and ask the people, the, the probands, to push a button once they see the word and decide whether they have seen it for the first time or the second time, something like this. And if you take these segments of the EEG, add them up, and divide them through the amount of uh, stimuli shown, then you get a result, as a result a component or a curve which is related to exactly to the neuronal processes um, uh, behind this, uh, this cognitive um, process. Interesting thing about it is that you, uh, you eliminate everything which is not related to the stimulus presentation. So the normal EEG is gone and you only have the um, the curves and the neuron activity which is related to the stimulus presentation. <coughs> and you measure it by the latency of this component, for example, if you have and about and with the amount of neuronal activity which is shown by the area under the curve. And be aware that by agreement the negativity is showing up and the positivity is showing is shown down. So what we did is we performed a continuous word recognition experiment where we presented words continuously, uh, for example, the word rose, which elicited for the next second, you see here, for the period of one second, elicited a certain amount of uh, components. If you present this word for a second time, you see another curve, and if you compare these two, you see a difference here. This is called old new effect, because old word is mean second presentation, the new word was the first presentation, and you see this difference. And this difference is a correlate of neuronal of the change of the neuronal activity due to the re recognition of this word for the second time. But it's the underlying processes are more, much more complex. I just go very briefly through it. So it's shown that this sensory analysis of the presented word, which happens between 50 and 120 milliseconds, you see. The, for example, uh, the orthographical analysis, which happens between 100 and 200 milliseconds. Then the accessing of the mental lexicon, which happens a little bit later. Then happens uh, semantic stimulus categorization and integration, which happens about around 400 milliseconds. You see a post-lexical integration of a stimulus, so you get an additional associations, and you show and uh, the later steps are uh, processing of additional uh, compounds, aspects. So I will focus on this N400 component, just briefly showing what these correlates of a neuronal activity um, show. Q Hilliard and Cutis made a very nice experiment where they read the person a certain sentence and the final word was, so for example, he's, it was his first day at work. A semantic context was given for the last word, work. So, this was a new, rather new, uh, neutral context. It was his first day at work. Yeah, and they tried to see what happens once they, this word was presented. And it's a rather uncomplicated curve here. But if they present, she put on her high-heeled shoes, then it was a totally different component. But even more interesting, if um, they presented the sentence, he spread his warm bread with socks. Then something else happens, there was an N400. And this component is a correlate of the neuron activity which is related to the context, semantic context integration processes. This is relevant for the data I show you now. But I will focus on this old new effect 
And this just briefly, you can also show where these things happen. After 200 milliseconds, you have activity on the left and front, left temporal and frontal lobe. About 400 milliseconds swaps to the other side. This is a mathematical procedure which you can use to, um, to get more information uh, from this EEG data. And after uh, the later stages, you have parietal, more in the back, this activity. And then you see on the right frontal area uh, this whole new effect happening. So, what about depression? We investigated depressive patients, but these are the data of the normal controls. But what you see is we divided these presented words regarding the emotional content. And you see that the EEG data of the negative words and positive words show a much bigger or new effect than the neutral verbs in the frontal area of the cortex as well as centrally. And compared to the, this is, these are the data for the whole scalp all over, on the left and the right side. If you compare these data with depressed patients, you see a massive reduction of this old new effect. And if you go back to the emotional influence, you see the same, same situation. You have a massive reduction of this effect here that the emotions are um, uh, help to remember something, that the emotional system induces an additional neuronal activity. And we interpre interpreted these data that, if you watch this here, you see that the N400 component, the semantic context integration component is gone, in the, especially in the negative verbs. How? We interpreted these data that the depressed patients who are normally in a negative emotional state, they have negative ruminations, they don't have to integrate these negative words into, the, into its, its own given context. So it's a certain type of no context integration, especially for negative uh, words necessary. What we also did is, back to the normal controls, we did, um, we had students of uh, acting who performed a similar, a similar trial and you see that inducing a negative emotional state leads to a reduction of this component here. So you can, by your own imaginations, what they did, uh, change this neural activity in the brain. Um, what we also did, we made some investigations with cannabis, for example, and cannabis led to a enhancement of the positive um, or of the neural activity for the positive words so that was just a mood congruence effect we think because uh, these cannabis users were just happier in the situation of using cannabis but this is not yeah i, w I would not recommend it especially in younger person to to do it because i as a psychiatrist i've also seen patients with a psychosis after cannabis use and with alcohol it was the other way around alcohol has had a tendency to enhance the emotional interaction for negative words, so the negative impression. What we also did was we investigated, uh, it's a different story, but it should show you what you can do with this type of method. We investigated the question how the Bonner disease virus does something to the human brain. Uh, there's a certain controversy, the Bonner disease virus was first described in the town of Bonner south of Leipzig and they uh, about hundreds of horses died 130 years ago and afterwards they learned that it was a virus who killed the horses and in the 1980s they found antibodies also in humans in schizophrenic patients later on they found antibodies against this virus in bipolar patients and depressed patients but it's still a controversy what exactly this virus does to humans we investigated depressed patients and treated them with an antiviral drug, which led to a better of the bettering of the depression. And, but we also investigated um, patients without, former patients, without um, uh, depression. And we found that the patients with a high level of, of Bonner disease virus parameters showed no uh, or new effect. The patients with a low level of Bonner virus showed at least a little bit of this old new effect and the healthy control groups had a very good old new effect. To summarize, 
The emotional and cognitive processes are closely interacting. Emotion cognition coupling can be helpful in therapeutic strategies and we use them in the therapy. And recognition memory can be differently, differentially influenced by emotional balance of the stimuli, self-induced mood states, affective disorders and psychotropic compounds and also possibly by a virus or the immune response to a virus. And risk-taking is influenced by mood changes. And finally, I, I had to skip a little bit about the depression. There's also a bipolar disorder, which is uh, which also patients with all, who also have um, uh, a manic symptomatology. And in the mania, they, patients may be very risk-taking. So depressed patients haven't don't have this risk taking and um, so finally the summary should be stay in a positive mood yeah because this enhanced your creativity and with a suitable portion of risk taking you might and uh, it should help you to catalyze growth thank you very much